Okay. And go back to sharing my screen so we can start working our way down from the brain down to reorient ourselves with the parts of the central and peripheral nervous system. And the way you should be thinking about this is if there's any, um, depending on what area we're in, if there was an injury there, then the symptoms the patient would have, besides the fact that there would be the symptoms of the inflammatory process translated in that area, which means swelling in a confined space, the symptoms will be translated for the patient, their clinical manifestations will be um, based on the area where the injury occurred. So if that, that means if it was in the frontal brain, then there might be motor or behavior changes. So you're, you have to consider the function of the area that has been injured. So the brain is very vulnerable. It takes 15% of our cardiac output, 20% of our oxygen consumption, and has no ability to store oxygen um, or any ability to engage in aerobic metabolism like our other cells can. So without oxygen, we have about 10 seconds before we start losing and injuring potential cells. Obviously, you're not going to be completely brain dead. You have more time, but you're going to start to lose some brain cells relatively quickly. Additionally, we need constant glucose, and there's no storage for glucose either. So we will sacrifice a lot to keep our brain alive. The nice thing about the brain and the central nervous system is its plasticity, meaning it has the ability to reorganize and change itself around if needed based on injury. So the peripheral nervous system, we do have some ability to regenerate nerves. In the central nervous system, we have no ability to regenerate nerves. If a nerve is lost, it's gone. However, we could teach a different part of the brain to do that other activity that a different nerve was doing. That's the whole basis of rehab. You know, if someone has a stroke and you they lost function and you do rehab, you can try to reteach an area of the brain to take over for those jobs and the brain is open to that. Um, the brain is divided, um, the cerebral cortex, so the higher functions of the brain are divided into different lobes um, or cortexes. So the frontal lobe is the anticipation and prediction of behavior, consequences, it contains the premotor cortex, which is in charge of movement planning, um, and the primary motor cortex, which is the message that will be sent to the spinal cord that will eventually result in motor movement. So that frontal lobe, this is that prefrontal cortex, and then this is the entire frontal cortex all the way to this division here where you see it's going to go into the sensory area. So this is all the frontal area. The parietal lobe is integrated sensory information and meaning and that's right behind the frontal lobe. This is located in blue. The primary sensory cortex in the parietal lobe and the primary motor cortex in the frontal lobe are close to each other because they are in constant um, communication with each other. The temporal lobe are the lobes on either side that are important. They're a part of memory as well as hearing and that's this lobe that goes right here that's kind of this yellowish mustardy color and then the back lobe Occipital lobe is our primary visual cortex. You'll see that there are some areas, and these are specifically speech areas, that overlap. So when we are speaking, 
our production of speech is a motor activity, so it's located in the frontal lobe. We have to hear speech, which is the auditory cortex, and then we have to understand speech, which is partially in the auditory cortex and partially in the sensory area because we have to integrate that information into what we already know. So if a person has a stroke, you know, they might have a stroke in this area in which, in Broca's area, which means they could still understand speech, but they wouldn't be able to speak as opposed to having an injury in Wernicke's area the patient can still speak, but they may not understand exactly. And those often, because of their different positions, those injuries can be separated. So that's our higher brain. And then as we move our way down, we're kind of going into deeper inside the brain tissue. So if we look at this picture, oops, I've got the drawing on. Let's try to widen that. If we look at this picture, this is showing you, again, this is the front, frontal lobe, parietal lobe. This central sulcus is the division between that primary sensory cortex and primary frontal cortex, temporal lobe, um, which is our hearing. This will be our overlap for speech. Here will be our overlap for understanding and then our vision. If we cut that in half, the cerebral cortex ends where this black line is. This is all cerebral cortex outside of that black line. And then we're going to move into a different portion of the brain where the, you see the limbic, corpus callosum, um, that area of the brain is referred to as um, the forebrain, is this area. The diencephalon is even deep to that. So the diencephalon includes the thalamus and the hypothalamus. The thalamus is sort of like a relay station. So if you were, um, Sometimes some of my analogies aren't as helpful depending on your age, but the old um, system of being a telephone operator where you would get a call and then they would say who they wanted and then you would take a peg and move it to the other place. You would relay it to the correct area of the brain. That's sort of what the thalamus is supposed to do. It's supposed to take in sensory information and then send it to the part of the brain where that interpretation could take place and then help so it's sort of helping to send signals in the direction they should go to. Additionally, it, there is some um, emotional hearing experience in this area. The hypothalamus, we will talk more about at the end of the semester because that's the part of the endocrine control. And that's when we talk about that. Um, the limbic system is in charge of our emotional experience and emotional related behavior, as well as um, I was gonna say, a sleep-wake cycle, um, alertness. So we have talked about the cerebral cortex. I just wanna be sure we're staying on the same organization path. The different lobes of the cerebral cortex which is part of um, the forebrain, which also includes the diencephalon as well as the hemispheres. And the diencephalon includes the thalamus and hypothalamus. And the thalamus is our relay center and the hypothalamus is endocrine control, which we'll talk about later, as well as the limbic system which is emotional experience, sleep-wake cycle. And then we're moving to the different part of the brain called the hind brain. So in this picture, you can actually see the parts that are um, sort of this tannish color are the forebrain areas, the cortex, and then this is 
the limbic system, hypothalamus, thalamus, and pituitary gland are over here. That's all the forebrain. This part that's in orange is the hind brain and sometimes referred to as the brainstem structures, which includes the cerebellum, pons, and medulla. And within that area is also the basal ganglia. It's hard to see though, because it's a piece that runs like around here, like to in a um, different, it's a, a flat piece that's hard to see in this particular type of picture. And the basal ganglia is in charge of controlling associated movements. So if you're walking, that's the arm swing. If you're throwing a ball, it's a follow through. If it's, it's holding your posture correctly, it's taking away any background motion. Um, so that's where it is in relationship to the diencephalon. The midbrain is superior to the pons. So that's right here under the basal ganglia. And the midbrain is where part of the cranial nerves come out to help control the face and the midbrain cranial nerves are responsible for movements of the eye. So if someone had damage to the midbrain, they may not be able to track their eyes correctly to follow objects because that's where different cranial nerves exit. The medulla, so we go back to this picture, we had our forebrain that included the cerebral cortex and the diencephalon. And then we have our hindbrain that has basal ganglia, midbrain, which was cranial nerves controlling the eye. Medulla is below the pons. And its role is in many of our vital functions. So we will talk about it when we talk about the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, when we talk about GI function, when we are specifically talking about the autonomic nervous system. Um, some of the other cranial nerves also exit the medulla. A large portion of the medulla is where the nerves that control motor movement cross over. Um, which is what this picture is trying to show you. And so sometimes people call that area the pyramids because to somebody those look like triangles, whoever found it first. So here's our brain, you know, our right side, my, if we're backwards, and my left side of my brain. And the primary motor cortex has come up with a plan based on sensory information to move um, the left side of my body. And that message will be sent through the thalamus down to where the medulla is. And at the level of the medulla, which is close to the neck before the spinal cord begins, there will be a crossover to the opposite side. And that is with all motor function. So if I had a stroke in this area or a tumor in this area or some kind of contusion or something in this area, I could hurt um, some of the motor nerves and potentially the outlet here on the side of the face because for the face, anything that's above the medulla, those cranial nerves, will affect that side of the head. There's no crossover for them. So I could have a facial droop or a change in the movements of my eye or um, sensory function of my face. But my other symptoms will be on the contralateral side because at the level of medulla, everything crosses over to the other side. The pons is a bridge. It is meant to 
some of the one of the, in particular the cranial nerve responsible for speech and chewing that feeds the jaw comes through the pons. It also is receiving information from the cerebral cortex and kind of bridging it and sending it to the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is supposed to help with delicate, fine, and smooth movements. This is where you get your hand-eye coordination and your gracefulness. Um, it's supposed to stop you from overshooting a target. Um, and all of the things that we have just spoken about, all the parts end up helping us this integrate into some sort of planned motor function, which is why we go through those parts. So this is all in the frontal cortex, um, which is intimately connected, as we saw in the cerebral cortex pictures of the lobes with the parietal lobe. So our afferent nerves send information up through the spinal cord into the brain to tell us about the environment um, around us, the physical layout, um, taking the information of what we're supposed to be doing here. We are sitting in class. Um, if I was teaching you know, in a regular class, I'd be taking in the information of the students, where the chalkboard is, where I'm gonna, where the slides are located so that I can adjust my movements. So that information then is taken and sent to the parietal lobe so that we can then plan our movement. So the premoral cortex was part of that prefrontal brain that was for movement planning. And the motor cortex is where that parietal lobe is in the frontal area. And that is going to send information down through the spinal cord and that will exit the spinal cord will be our lower motor nerve, that efferent nerve, efferent nerve that will tell our muscles to move. This message has other um, pieces to it. It's not just plan the movement, send that message down. We still have um, the basal ganglia, which helps with coordination and smoothing of movement and contralateral movement and associated movement and cerebellum, which takes the, also starts to take away background noise and helps with follow through um, and movement planning that is also sending messages down to the, um, you know, from the upper motor neuron down to help our movement be more smooth. So usually that's the path our somatic nervous system will take going through this whole set of um, stages. However, sometimes we can bypass some of these higher areas and just have a reflex, a spinal reflex. So in development, is the cerebellum not developed fully or the function not developed fully? So in, in the whole brain is not, the function isn't developed fully when you're born. You have to come up with, they call it like schema maps for, um, how to use the areas of the brain. So it's sort of like this empty canvas to help um, grow and change over time by stimulus, um, by attempted effort. Um, and as like motor areas mature, then the child is capable of more movement, but it's sort of like an empty canvas ready for stimulus to figure out how to lay down different nerve maps, if that answers the question, hopefully. So if I'm going to have, so the next couple of slides are just sort of trying to explain um, regular motor movement. And this is key it's, um, to understanding whether or not somebody's 
symptoms, especially their motor and sensory peripheral symptoms, are because of a central nervous system problem or peripheral nervous system problem, because either way, the symptoms might be the same, which can be difficult. A person could come and see you and complain of motor weakness or paresthesia, sensory dysfunction, and the problem could be within the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system. You cannot tell just by the complaint alone. So the person comes in and says that they feel weak. I can't say if that's a brain issue or a peripheral nerve issue just by looking at that complaint because that's an, it's an integrative function. There's central nervous system work and there's peripheral nervous system work. So if I, um, here's my little brain, I have planned a movement that will then come down and cross over in the medulla and go down the level of the spinal cord to maybe my arm. And then a peripheral nerve will come from that area to innervate a muscle. So, and here's our muscle. The problem could be the muscle. Maybe I tried to send the, the muscle a message, but the muscle itself isn't working. So I could send it messages all day. It's still not going to work. So that could be the problem. It could be the problem here the, in the synapse between the nerve and the muscle. The problem could be this nerve is damaged in some way. Or this could all be fine and the problem could be here. I wouldn't be able to tell just with this chief complaint. I would need more information, more ideas about the clinical manifestations that go with it, which we'll talk about when we get into the pathology. So motor and sensory nerves. The afferent nerves are the sensory nerves that are carrying information in to the central nervous system. And it's sort of um, organized by spinal nerves depending on which level of the spine we're talking about. So there's eight pairs um, in the neck area, the cervical area, there's pairs in the thoracic area, lumbar area, sacral area, and coccygeal. So if it's my arm, then it's gonna be a cervical sensory nerve that will notice, um, that will pick up on information in the environment send that to the correct level of the spine, and then that information will be relayed up to the brain. And it, the relay, part of that is achieved by which segment of the spine we're talking about. That's how partially how this is interpreted. And then again, that can cause a movement to occur. And so this is the afferent and efferent pair. Some information came in at this level, and then some information came out at this level. Which is different. How I react and plan movement is different than how I would react if I'm, if I'm not allowing, if the central nervous system itself is not a part of the interpretation and movement planning, then it's a reflex. So oops, we've been talking about cases of taking in sensory information, the, the cortex creating a plan for movement, and then the movement occurs completely voluntary with some background chatter that we're not always aware of. But sometimes we don't have to have complete um, central nervous system interpretation for the movement to occur, and that's when we use what's here, these, the spinal cord reflex circuitry, which is different than the upper and lower motor nerve function. So I have my brain and my spinal column, and I have 
my little arm here, and normally there's sensory information that comes in and is interpreted, and then I decide to make a movement, and that comes out. So I have my afferent and efferent nerves. And that occurs because there's communication with the brain. I could potentially take in information and move right away. And that is a reflex. I can do that without interpretation. The information will eventually be sent up to the brain. Because, you know, if you withdraw because of pain, you don't have to wait for interpretation of the pain. You can move. But eventually... You, your brain figures out why that occurred. It's not like you don't know what happened. So, and we're going to talk about this a bunch of times, but this is one of the ways you can decide if the damage that's occurring that's leading to any weakness is related to lower motor nerve function or upper motor nerve function. Because if the damage is here, then the reflexes won't work. But if the damage is here, the reflexes will work. And that's a very important concept that we're going to go over a bunch of times. Yes, that is one of the types of reflexes. So if I touch a hot stove, that pain, pain is very primitive. That information is sent to the spinal cord at the level of the spinal cord that occurred and then you would withdraw without interpretation of the brain. Eventually the brain will figure it out but you didn't need it to for it to occur. The other thing that we typically talk about in terms of reflexes in terms of assessment are deep tendon reflexes. So if I have a patient that comes in say they're complaining of their leg feeling weak and I want to see um, what their, this is my knee here, and foot. I want to see if their lower motor nerves are functioning. I can do a deep tendon reflex to see if the lower motor nerve is working because there would not need to be any interpretation at the central nervous system level in order for the deep tendon reflex to occur. So when I tap the tendon, that will cause this muscle to shorten. And it's going to want to contract. The stimulus of the tendon will cause contraction of this muscle. What has to happen correspondingly is that this muscle has to relax. That's the reflex. So if I give send this information causing contraction of this muscle, the corresponding muscle group has to relax. And this is all done at the level of the muscle and this nerve. It's no, nothing occurs up here. So it's a way to test or distinguish between lower motor and upper nerve, upper motor nerve function. And then we also have to worry about the action that occurs at the nerve and muscle that we mentioned before. So whew, that's a lot of information. Essentially, what you have to remember from this section, because we're obviously going to talk about dysfunction too, but what you have to remember from this section is that if there is any kind of injury to these areas, especially inside the brain itself, then depending on the, what is that area of the brain is in charge of, there could be corresponding symptoms. If I hit the speech area in some, with some kind of injury, then I'm going to have trouble, um, the motor section, I might have trouble speaking. If I hit the occipital area, I'm going to have trouble taking in visual information. But sometimes the symptom can be vague, especially if it has to do with somatic motor movement or general paresthesia. It can be hard to tell then exactly where the issue is because it could be in the lower nerves or the upper nerves. So we need more information to figure that out. So before we take another little little break, 
I want to review um, the inflammatory process, which we kind of did already. So this will be good because when we think about nerves, there are primary injuries and secondary injuries that are based on what happened and then how that translates into inflammation and injury in a nerve itself. So the brain and all nerves are susceptible to all types of cellular injury that we talked about. So what were the mechanisms of cellular injury that we talked about in the first class? Like what? Right, right, right. So, correct. So, somehow there is damage taking place. That damage will translate into um, types of injuries that can be reversible or irreversible. Um, but it all starts with the same thing. So it could be trauma, like you're directly hit. Ischemia, you know, where there's a section that doesn't get any blood flow. Can you think of any other ones? I mean, those are two of the main ones. Radiation. Um, infection, right drugs or nutritional um, drugs or toxins, um, nutritional deficiencies, yes, bacterial toxins, all of those initial modes of injury that we talked about in general, trauma, ischemia, radiation, infection, effects of nutritional excess or deficiencies, effects of drugs or toxins, are the same types of injuries, sure, autoimmune, the same types of injuries that can occur onto nerves. If that occurs, the injury could be reversible or irreversible. If um, the injury is we have a little more wiggle room in terms of reversible injury in the periphery than we do in the brain. Because everything that occurs in the brain is in a closed space, which compounds any issue we have with swelling. So, oops, I don't want either of those things. Um, so, if we Think about the things that you guys just listed. There's certainly many ways you can hit your head or have a traumatic injury. Ischemia could be lack of blood flow, but that could also be related. So that could be a clot or um, a thrombus, um, thrombotic buildup. It could be um, compression from a tumor or something that could lead to ischemia. Um, the brain can be subjected to radiation. You could get meningitis or different kinds of infections. There's certainly nutritional excesses that especially can occur in childhood, infancy, um, exposure to different toxins could certainly affect and injure the brain. And we know that that gets translated into the inflammatory process and our innate, and if there's an infection involved, adaptive immunity. And those other injury processes that we talked about, which were related to decreased oxygen, free radicals, um, changes in calcium. We talked about those other mechanisms that either could be reversible or irreversible. Those same things apply to neurons. So if a neuron is injured, we have some hopes for its recovery based on where it's located. We definitely have more luck with peripheral nerves. And based on three essential pieces of information that you definitely want to write down. 
um, where on the nerve it took place, the injury, it's always better for the injury to occur closer to the axon than to the cell body. I'd much rather have the injury in this area. I'd rather the injury be a crushed injury than to completely cut the nerve. I have more of a chance to fix it if it's a crush than a cut. And I want this particular tissue right here with this endoneurium, that little purple thing around it, I want that to stay intact because it helps with the healing. So if my injury damaged that endoneurium, then it's going to be much, much harder for me and probably won't be able to heal it. So I need an intact endoneurium. I'd rather have a crush than a cut. And I want my injury to be close to the axon and certainly in the periphery. But um, I have to deal with, no matter where it is located, both the vascular and cellular response to injury. So any of those mechanisms that we talked about could lead to cell membrane injury, which um, was mentioned, and um, which means that we could release arachnidonic acid and form prostaglandins, which cause vasodilation and increased pain response. We could then activate complement, which also um, causes um, vasodilation, kinin, which helps with vasodilation and the pain response. And depending on the ves adjacent vessels, there will be, you know, the coagulation cascade. Um, activation. The mast cells, there's still mast cells there because there's still vessels there. Mast cells are always hanging around vessels, so they will degranulate, releasing histamine, which we know is a potent vasodilator and also causes contraction of endothelial cells to open up pores of blood vessels to allow food and protein to leave. And when that protein leaves, we increase oncotic osmotic pressure in the interstitial space, which also pulls fluid in. And we open those pores as a way to help us get white blood cells, the cellular stage, um, get those cells to the area of injury and particular neutrophils, which will contribute to the exudate formation and macrophages, which will end up assisting in actual tissue healing, especially in the periphery but could also segue us into the adaptive response as needed. So now if this injury occurs in a closed skull, there's more of a problem, right? Because there's only so much space. So if we increase the amount of inflammation in a closed space, what, what, what could happen here for us? Compression. So that's the issue. So there's no place for this to go. So compression will take place. It was someone's feedback is kind of bad, but there'll be compression in that area. The ischemia is also is from compression as as well as what you're saying is loss of blood flow is in the brain has something called cerebral blood flow autoregulation. And so the brain will try to actually disperse blood from areas of inflammation to try to decrease the volume of tissue and fluid that's in an, in a certain area, which will make it harder to, to heal that area, but in the short term have decreased compression to that area. Um, and the patient will experience swelling or inflammation in a closed space as pain and an increased, or I should say a decreased level of consciousness and potential nausea and vomiting. This is what the patient will experience. Healing this will be difficult, um, especially in the brain, allowing that swelling to go down, especially in the brain because of the closed space. In the peripheral area, this is showing you how if the, the macrophages are what are going to help 
um, stimulate the glial cells to repair the peripheral nerves to hopefully successfully regenerate the nerve. However, depending on where the injury took place, if it's closer to the cell body, if the endoneurium isn't intact, we might end up not being able to regenerate this nerve. And without stimulation, the muscle will get smaller and atrophy. So besides the fact that the vascular and cellular stages of inflammation will greatly increase exudate and edema, it, in the brain, in the nerve cells, it can also cause electrolyte changes. This is sometimes called an excito ex oh, sorry, excitoxic amino acid injury um, because the nerve cells are supported by glial cells. These Glial cells, those astrocytes, create a neurotransmitter called glutamine that is supposed to regulate calcium um, in, in order to um, package up the neurotransmitters and make the neurotransmitters. So if this area is also injured, glutamine will be released and that causes calcium to go inside the cell. And we, if you remember from the first unit, we don't want a lot of calcium in any cell because it triggers enzyme reactions inside the cell and can cause damage to your mitochondria and it's, it's bad for the cell. So we could also increase injury to nerves because of an influx of calcium. So the nerve injury might change how the action potential propagates down the axon. It might open channels that are supposed to be closed. We will definitely have more sodium and calcium inside the neuron itself, which will pull more water in, causes more swelling. Um, and so we'll have electrolyte disturbance on top of inflammation. And the electrolyte disturbance will actually increase inflammation. So it's not, obviously we don't want, I mean, there's a lot of key functions that occur with nerves. We don't want to injure them, but injuring them adds extra problems. And certainly a swollen nerve will not generate an action potential very fast. It'll be slow and less responsive. And a swollen nerve with electrolyte abnormalities will not be able to generate an action potential until resting potential returns. And it's harder to return to resting potential if we don't have good blood flow. So we kind of set ourselves up, it's best not to injure this area at all, is the message there. So where we will return at nine o'clock for the end of this lecture is to begin to talk about some of the dis neurologic dysfunctions um, and especially important for us to get to is the effects of concussion. So we'll talk in the beginning a little bit about some um, lower and upper nerve functions, and then we'll talk about traumatic brain injury. So we'll return at nine o'clock to finish that up. So I will go to the back. Okay, guys, just 30 more minutes of neurologic suffering. Um, so now we're on to dysfunction. So let me share my screen again. I did um, hit record again. So let's see, share. So we're going to talk about some disorders. And beginning with disorders that could occur at the neuromuscular junction. So that's where the nerve synapse, that presynaptic terminal, terminal ends when it hits the muscle. So we didn't, we didn't talk specifically about things that can occur at the muscle level itself, but there are 
different muscular degenerative diseases like um, muscular dystrophy, which are genetic disorders of muscle fiber growth. Um, muscles themselves can atrophy without continued stimulus from peripheral nerves, such as when there's a spinal injury or something like that. Um, the upper motor nerve and the lower motor nerve can be attacked, uh, intact, sorry, and functioning um, and release a neurotransmitter, but the problem could be within the space between, sorry, the problem could be in the, in the um, here's our skeletal muscle, here's our nerve, the problem could be in what's called the neuromuscular junction or this whole space here. So the muscle works and the nerve works. The stimulus came down, neurotransmitter is released into the synapse and um, the problem is someplace in there. So you can have disorders of neuromuscular junction related to um, neurotoxins which um, such as nerve gas or chemical warfare, because what those neurotoxins do is they block the end plate, they block the, the release of the neurotransmitter. So the nerve itself is intact, the neurotransmitter is there, the impulse goes down. However, the neurotransmitter can't be released in the synapse because it's blocked by, you know, botulism toxin, which is the principle behind Botox or from some sort of chemical agent. Whereas myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune attack on the receptors that the neurotransmitter is supposed to land on. So we're supposed to have a certain amount of receptors on the skeletal muscle that once the neurotransmitter interfaces with will cause contraction of that muscle if there is autoimmune damage to some of the receptors, even though the muscle works and the neurotransmitter and nerve is working, if there isn't the same amount of receptors, the muscle contraction will be weaker and will fatigue easier. And that's what happens in myasthenia gravis. The patient will start to complain of um, weakened muscles and um, more muscle fatigue. And in general, it happens in certain areas. It starts to happen um, in the swallowing area and in the, in the eyelids, um, but it could occur other places. If I were to assess this patient, um, I would notice that their deep tendon reflexes or the function of the lower motor and sensory nerves were intact because the nerves themselves were fine. It's that the muscle receptors are absent. And so the way that people end up treating this is to target the enzyme that's supposed to break down the neurotransmitter inside the synapse, because if I allow the neurotransmitter to be there longer, then it's possible that the patient will have a stronger muscle contraction. So I can have a peripheral nerve disorder. So if it's a motor disorder, it's considered the lower motor nerve, but I could have a peripheral sensory nervous disorder too. So we have to remember where that nerve is located. So there's no issue in, um, in that. If this is the, the spinal segment, you know, our upper motor nerve has come down. There is a um, kind of a interspinal nerve and then the nerve that leaves that spinal segment. The damage, the problem is with this nerve. Um, or it's the nerve that's supposed to be sending a message back to the spinal, into the central nervous system for sensory data. This is still the peripheral nerve. Um, so peripheral neuropathy is any disorder of peripheral nerves that will 
include sensory changes, muscle weakness, with or without atrophy, or both of those things. And if it's a single nerve that's affected, it's a mononeuropathy. If it's multiple nerves, it's a polyneuropathy. Uh, mononeuropathies can be caused by compression or trauma or infection. Some examples could be um, shingles that is caused by varicella infection. In the past, the varicella or chickenpox virus never leaves the body completely. It's dormant in one of our spinal nerves. And that infection can be reawakened by a decrease in immune function. And then that nerve trunk, that nerve that the varicella virus was latent, will then become inflamed because there's a reactivation of an infection. Um, another example, I could have uh, inflammation, um, compression, or damage to a nerve because of a fractured bone, and that could um, I could have. My bone could be broken, and I could also have some sensory and motor dysfunction. I could have um, carpal tunnel syndrome, in which case the um, cartilage that crosses the palmar aspect, lower palmar aspect of the hand, where the medium nerve runs under, if that gets swollen, then there's compression on that nerve. Um, polyneuropathies mean that there are multiple neurons that are affected. Typically, it's the longest axons that are involved first, so people will notice symptoms in their distal extremities, their feet or their hands. And polyneuropathies usually result from damage to the axon from demyelination, and the symptoms could either be mixed, meaning sensory motor or just motor or just sensory. It depends on the cause. Causes of polyneuropathies could be immune-mediated. Immune um, the example there is Guillain-Barre syn syndrome. Could be related to toxicities from alcohol or lead. Um, so some of the injuries that we talked about just before we took our break, or metabolic diseases, especially diabetes, can damage um, myelin and the nerves. And diabetic polyneuropathy is a very common disorder. Guillain-Barre is an acquired autoimmune disease that leads to demyelination of the peripheral nerves. And it's usually acute onset and is an ascending motor paralysis, meaning the patient will start to feel weakness in the longest axons, so um, like the hands or the feet, and then it'll start to move upwards. So soon the whole lower leg might not feel like it's working correctly, or even the thigh hip area might not feel like it's working correctly. Um, the worst issue could be that there's such diffuse um, peripheral nerve issues that they can't maintain their um, respiratory system and then they need quite a bit of supportive care. So what's happening is there's probably some kind of infection viral component in which there is infiltration of um, cells of the immune system in the myelin. And it's just our own over response to whatever viral infection causes this demyelination. And it's self-limiting. It should um, eventually go away and the myelin should rebuild. Um, another example of a, could potentially be a mononeuropathy or um, polyneuropathy, depending on how many nerves are affected, could be um, a, um, compression on a nerve related to degenerative disc disease. So normally, the vertebrae, we have our bones of the back, um, and then we'll have a disc. So we have a bone and a disc, and then another bone. And these discs act as shock absorbers and help with movement of the spine. If you looked at the disc um, instead of this, instead of, um, we looked at it in the transverse orientation, we would see that the outside of the disc is more hard and the inside is more like a gel. 
over time, just like cartilage everywhere, this can dry out, which means that this disc won't be as good as it of its job of shock absorbing. It might get thinner and not support our back as well, which could lead us to um, a decrease in disc height. Um, it could be that because we lost this disc height, that those vertebrae can slide on each other and we could have some malalignment of our spine and we could have narrowing of the spinal canal if that's the way the discs move um, or we could have compression of nerves that leave the spine and that's a herniated disc so if this disc cracks and dries out here, then some of the gel that's in the disc will come out. Um, so here's our what our normal disc should look like, that hard outer area and the soft gel area. And if this cracks and the gel can come out and compress the nerves either leaving the spinal canal, which are in charge of motor, or entering the spinal area, which are in charge of sensory, or both which is usually the case. So the person will have some degree of pain and or um, change in their ability to move. So anyone who has some of these polyneuropathies, whether it be diabetic um, neuropathy or um, this herniated disc issue or Guillain-Barre, depending on the level of the injury, how far the damage goes up the nerve axon, how many nerves are affected. If I did a um, checked deep tendon reflex and withdrawal, that result will likely be diminished because the central nervous system is still trying to send information down the, you know, the brain is trying to send information down to the spine. But if there is damage here where the nerve is supposed to leave, or there's damage to the nerve here, then the patient might have altered sensation or decreased movement. And if I would check their reflexes, so have my sensory and motor, if I would check their reflex, because the damage is here, the reflex will be absent or dampened. Does that make sense? Hopefully, because that's really important. Because it's different if the nerve damage is on top. If the issue is, you know, the, the sensory and motor lower nerves that are in the spine are working perfect, it's just that the information being sent down is slow or altered. So the damage is in the upper motor nerve. The patient still might have weakness, especially, or some degree of paresthesia. They still might, there still might be a problem. But if I check their deep tendon reflex, because these nerves are intact, there won't be any change to their reflex. So that's one way that I can distinguish between an upper or lower motor nerve, no. The deep tendon reflexes should not slow just with aging. The person might certainly have some muscle change um, and might have, but there, the reason will be related to some other issue. Um, so an example of an upper disease could be multiple sclerosis, which is a different type of autoimmune disorder in which the myelin sheaths are attacked by our um, immune, um, immune cells and will cause times of acute inflammation and breakdown of the myelin. And then there'll be a remitting, remitting phase in which the autoimmune um, action tends to quiet down for a little bit to allow for healing of the nerve that was damaged and the patient will be, might be symptom free until the autoimmune inflammation increases again and the symptoms might come back.
Um, this is thought to be, again, some kind of viral infection. Some, some of it has been linked to Epstein-Barr infection that sensitizes our immune system to start to attack our nerves. So it could be what I just described, which was relapsing and remitting. We're at periods of autoimmune attack of the myelin, and then we have times where that's not happening, so we can actually heal versus it being more of a progressive disorder. ALS is actually a mixed problem. It can be both an upper and lower issue. It completely involves motor nerves. It, it does not um, affect uh, the brain at all or sensory information. It's that we can no longer um, send the motor information down. It usually starts um, in the lower nerves. It's not autoimmune. It's actually um, scarring that occurs on the nerves, and that reason is is partially genetic and definitely partially unknown. Um, and then this l last thing I really want to talk about um, is brain injury, um, especially as this is common and it does not require always require direct contact so sometimes people think of brain injury as directly hitting your head against something but because the brain is is not attached to anything it's floating in the cerebral spinal fluid just colliding can cause awkward movement that could potentially damage the brain as it moves um, around its axis or as it bumps against the skull. So common pathways of brain damage. It could, there could be ischemia, that excitatory amino acid injury talked about with the increased calcium and sodium inside the neuron, definitely swelling, and that swelling leads to increased intracranial pressure. So types of brain injuries can be described as primary or secondary injuries. Primary injuries have to do with the, the actual event, either the direct impact or the axonal injury, which I'll show you is slightly different. And the secondary injury has to do with the subsequent swelling, um, hypoxia, and the, yes, just like a concussion. The secondary injuries that occur have to do with the inflammatory process, which can lead to swelling and hypoxia. Um, so we, it's obviously easy to tell when someone is hit directly on the head, they're absorbing um, whatever energy, whether, whatever it is that they hit or collided, hit their head on the wall or whatever, that's easier to see where that injury would be. But there's also injury related to movement of the brain in the skull, because the skull is fixed, but the brain is not. So you can have acceleration, deceleration injuries. So if I'm driving in a car and I get hit, um, if I get rear-ended, I am going to be pushed forward my whole body and then pushed and then I will automatically move backwards as part of my motion because my motion was interrupted. So I will not only have the injury, yes, just like with blast. So I will not only have, you know, the injury from moving, from being hit by the car, which is the whiplash injury, but what I'll have is sometimes referred to as a coup contra coup injury. So when I'm pushed forward and I move forward, my brain pushes and hits the front of my skull. And then as I move backwards, as because of my interrupted movement, my brain will hit the back of my skull. So I have now had, even though I didn't have my head directly hit, I still have a primary brain injury caused by impact. This time I could have contusions or bleeding 
related to the movement of my brain forward and backwards because it's still going to move. It's object in motion stays in motion and my movement was just arrested. This rotational twisting injury um, is an important issue, especially when you're thinking of different contact sports. So I don't have to hit my head. I can just be knocked off course depending on which way I was going. So if I'm standing here and I get hit from behind, like we talked about, I, my brain is going to move forward and then backward. So I'm potentially bouncing against my skull. But then my brain here on its spinal column, those axons as they move forward and move back, those long axons from the frontal brain down the spine are going to be potentially pulled um, which is its own, this stretching or shearing of nerve fibers as they're pulled forward and backwards is also an injury. If I'm right here and I get hit from the side, the other, and I get sort of twisted around, then the problem is, this is my brain, I will actually twist, the brain itself will twist inside and I will also not just um, stretch my nerve fibers, I can shear and stretch as they, as they spin. And that's why it, helmets are not the only thing, um, you know, having helmets that absorb energy that have, so that they, that the person, the energy is dispersed, will be helpful with the direct injury in football of two people's heads collide and they're wearing helmets, I can decrease the force by spreading it out across the helmet. So that that's good. But I still haven't taken away the movement that occurs of the brain because it's not fixed. And I don't have to hit heads with somebody for that to occur. They could just bump me very forcibly, obviously, if we're playing football. Um, and that severity can be I mean, if you've seen people get hit during football, I mean, there, that is a significant axonal injury that is occurring. So depending on the degree of injury, depending on how many axons have been hurt, depends on what you might classify this injury as, whether it be mild, moderate, or severe. You could have a mild concussion, or a mild axon injury that's caused shearing or stretching, or a mild head injury in which the brain has bumped into the skull, um, versus a moderate to severe, depending on how large the injured area is. So mild traumatic brain injury will have transitory clinical symptoms, almost like you short-circuited a little bit, um, and then there, but there's no loss of consciousness. Moderate concussion means there is a loss of consciousness, loss of consciousness accompanied by post-traumatic antegrade amnesia, meaning that I don't remember what happened since the time I got hit. Um, and it could be as long as a day. I don't, I don't remember anything that occurred. Um, you could have, uh, it could leave this person with much more debilitation. Um, which could be permanent depending on the degree of injury versus a very severe one where they might be, you know, intubated and out for a long period of time. So not only do we have this primary injury from axonal stretching and shearing and contusion if our skull or our brain is hitting our skull, but now we have to deal with the secondary injury that occurs because of the primary injury, because of the inflammatory response. We know from what we know about inflammation that there will be um, vasodilation, there will be um, edema, and a large amount of oxidate formation from neutrophils, even in this area. That's how it will end up healing, but that means increased pressure um, and we know that swollen nerves do not receive information or send information as well. And we know that it will be harder to get back to resting potential um, if 
there's calcium influx. And if there's decreased blood flow to the area in order to allow for electrolyte changes. So this means that a person who plays a sport especially has a risk of secondary injury. They will have swelling, that's their secondary injury, but we could make it worse by causing what's called secondary impact syndrome. So I know they're gonna have a second secondary injury in terms of primary secondary brain injury. So they have that primary injury and then they're gonna have swelling for sure. But because of this swelling, they will have a decreased response time and already inflammation so that if they get injured again, they're gonna have more inflammation on top of the first inflammation. That's called secondary impact syndrome, which has some, been sometimes a cause of death by allowing people to return to play early. The other issue is we don't know what happens with this trauma over time. So the patient, if the patient has plays um, in sports with heavy contact, maybe they're in the military and have been in war zones where there's been multiple bombs and um, energy in injuries that occur with blowback. Um, there is, those people are experiencing repetitive trauma and each time that occurs, there has to be some healing and that healing can lead to scarring. And so how much it can a person's brain take? It's hard to know because we don't automatically do a meticulous autopsy of everyone's brain after every death. But there is evidence to support the disease called chronic traumatic encephalopathy in which cumulative brain injury leads to um, a decline in neurologic function. So where those arrows are pointing are at scarred areas of previous injury and it will usually happen in the central areas, which we know is the sleep-wake cycle, emotional response, and message relay center. So people with cumulative brain trauma are often have issues with mood disturbance, emotional disturbance, um, and occasionally issues with dementia and things like that from this loss of brain tissue. And there has been, yep, yes, yeah, and they, his family donated his brain. Um, yes, there's a lot of, there's a lot of movies and documentaries about that. There's a scientist at BYU who has been collecting football players' brains in general and performing um, autopsies on them showing a degree of cumulative encephalopathy and these people also have mood disorders. There was another young college football player that committed suicide um, that might explain some violent behavior or early dementia behavior. Um, and so the recommendation after those kinds of movies um, is that people shouldn't play football. And I know that I'm doing my best with this lecture if you feel bad about it, because really people shouldn't. Uh, there's, there's no way that that game is good for anyone's brain, anyone's body who's playing it for sure. Because we know that the inflammatory process and the wound healing process takes a while. We learned in the last class when there's an injury, there's the vascular and cellular inflammation and then wound healing, and that can take several weeks. It can be two weeks before someone heals from um, mild to moderate traumatic brain injury. Before, and if we subject them to a second injury, we compound that for them. And if they're still injured when they play, their reflexes are slower and they're more prone to a second injury. And over time, what do we think is going to do to someone's brain with that amount of cumulative injury is the thought. So, um, and then we're at the end of the class time here. The other thing, the base, um, Parkinson's, 
we didn't talk about and we didn't talk about Alzheimer's. So I'll have to record at least those two diseases because those are um, things that you might confront more commonly um, as a separate thing. Um, so just re to reiterate, you have till um, 1030 tonight to adjust your exam question related to sickle cell. You have till Sunday at midnight to edit case study three based on what we talked about. And then of course, there's a lot of stuff due coming up. Um, so it's not like you won't have a lot of stuff to do. Uh, any questions about anything we, we talked about or anything that's due? You are welcome. Otherwise, you can certainly email me if you haven't already set up an appointment with me. Please do that. Don't give up. It's going to be all right. <laughs> this too shall pass, as they say. Yeah, have a good night, guys. Have a good weekend. Um, and certainly let me know if you need anything. All right. Take care, guys.